All right, geographers, gonna get into our final lecture for the class. This one's gonna be on biomes, and I'll get into what a biome is, what that means, and then I'll talk about, I'm gonna talk about three biomes. There are more than that, but we're not gonna do a catalog list that's boring and uh, pointless and all that. So we'll talk about a few that uh, connect some of the stuff we've already been talking about, connect some dots here, uh, and then we'll wrap up with this idea of geoengineering and how our, our biomes have changed as humanity has changed them and, uh, and what we can do about it, right? And what our future holds. So that's the, that's the plan for today. So a biome, it's a big ecosystem, right? And it's, it's one that is very stable <clears throat> in the sense that it's, it's been around for a while. It's big enough to, uh, to continue to stay around for a while. So that's what that means by stable. <clears throat> uh, we can do terrestrial or aquatic, meaning on land or out in the water. We're going to do land because that's what we've been doing pretty much throughout the entire class. Uh, and really with these, we're, we're naming a biome based on its dominant vegetation. Right? What kinds of plants are there? Right? And in the case of like the desert biome, it can kind of almost be the absence of plants. But I'll get into their very specific uh, things there. But we're looking at plants. And really we do that because that's, A, it's, it's the easiest thing to see, right? Plants aren't running away and hiding like animals and stuff can do. So it's it's easy in that sense, uh, but it's also, it can tell us a lot about all these other things, right? Things, the, the abiotic factors that we've been talking about. So in terms of solar radiation coming down, water availability, the quality as well as the quantity. We can learn something about the underlying geology and so on. So geographers who study this stuff, people who study biomes can be into really kind of, you know, get a, a sense of, uh, uh, you know, what's going on simply by looking at what kinds of plants are there. And so that's what we'll be, we'll be talking about here with these, these uh, biomes. We'll also get into the animals, the the critters that are there, because that's, I mean, plants are important, but I don't know, maybe you do. I don't get excited uh, about the plants specifically. It's it's more the little, you know, fuzzy things that uh, run around in a biome. So we'll, we'll get into those too. Uh, but whatever we're talking about, whether it's the plants, whether it's the the different animals, the whatever organisms we're talking about, when we're looking at biomes, we want to make sure that we're looking at the ideal species, meaning the things that have evolved and adapted within that biome and not things that humans brought over, right, from a different biome. Because that's, that's one thing we humans love to do is to, um, you know, get stuff and, and start to use it and domesticate it and then bring it over to a new area and introduce it into an ecosystem uh, and that's what we would call an exotic species okay? uh, and an exotic species it, it invasive species is another term that is uh, used but it's just anything any plant or animal that is not native not indigenous to a specific ecosystem well I, I mean like this one right here right what's that what are we looking at right here that's a nutria, uh, and it's a, we don't have scale with this one. Um, this is a much better representation. I don't know who this guy, I stole this uh, photo from uh, Google, uh, but you gotta, I mean, it's this giant beaver rat thing, and I believe they're South American to start with, but they were brought up to the Southern United States, Louisiana specifically, uh, and used for, I think the original idea was that, you know, in these waterways where you had plants growing and it was difficult to take a boat through there, you introduce some of these little rat beaver things, the nutria, and you uh, they'll eat all of these plants and it's easier to cruise around, right? 
The problem in doing that, well, apart from having a giant rat, uh, you know, in your home, uh, is the, the idea that these things took off. They did quite well. Um, in the area, and in part because, as a, we talked about before, when humans move into a new place, they love to just eradicate predators, uh, be, you know, because natural predators can, you know, take out their livestock or, or whatever, just be scary for humans. And in doing so, it means stuff like the nutria here. They don't have anything to keep their populations in check, right? So these things are everywhere and you know it's, it's fun if you're hanging out in louisiana like you know w when you have the ability to go travel and explore go to go to southern louisiana have a good time when you're out like drinking in, in new orleans and and whooping it up and then you're going back to the hotel that night make sure to look into uh uh you know the the, the sewers and ditches and, and stuff like that uh and you'll see giant giant rodents and it'll freak you out. They're just, I mean, they're kind of cute when you feed them lollipops, but they're also terrifying. Uh, so that's an exotic species. Another one that's bad, uh, and this is like a, a almost like double exotic thing, uh, are killer bees. All right? Now, killer bees are, they're, they're something humans made, not just introduced into a new ecosystem, but altered to the point uh, where there's something new. They're not natural, right? It gets back to that artificial selection. So they're they're domesticated in the sense that humans have changed them, um, but also terrifying, right? Hence the name. So in the Americas, we have, you know, indigenous bees, but we also have European honeybees, and these were brought over by Europeans. So what we think of as the bees that produce our honey, those are exotic creatures okay? and they're great um you know not all exotic species have to be bad we we like having european honeybees over here right and the idea was back in the 1950s um let's you know let's bring some european honeybees down to a place like brazil so that brazil can you know increase its agricultural output and have honey and things like that but European honeybees just weren't cutting it. They weren't tough enough um, to hang out in the, you know, the jungle. Um, so somebody got the idea, hey, let's take these sweet little European honeybees and let's mix them with these tougher African honeybees, which, you know, are also capable of producing honey, um, but they're, they're tough, aggressive, nasty things. And the idea was if you take these hardcore African bees and these nice, sweet, gentle European bees, and yeah, you put them together, you'll get, you know, still a sweet, sweet bee, but but one that can defend itself, right? That can survive in a harsh environment like in in Brazil, right? That was the goal, and instead we got these nasty, awful little Nazi bees that that came from all of this. So it didn't it didn't work. The European sweet bees were just kind of you know, wiped out in that sense, and they just became these turbocharged, angry, aggressive bees. And they're they're often called Africanized honeybees, which a lot of Africans don't like that uh, description, the idea that it, it makes it sound like, like Africa, you know, corrupted um, these bees. But they are, regardless, I like killer bees anyway, because it sounds scarier. Uh, but these things are terrifying in that they are so aggressive and it, you know it's the case where like a european honeybee it doesn't want to sting you and if it does it's gonna die and it doesn't want to do that can't we just be cool and it might kind of scare you a little bit and then that's it african honeybees or these africanized killer bees um they, they'll keep keep after you for miles like they just they won't rest until something is dead and that something doesn't even have to be you know, an animal or a person who's up messing with the, the hive. There, there was a story years ago in, in Texas. Um, yeah, and that's right. Texas, in, in the United States, uh, because these things escaped, uh, of course, which always happens, and they just, you know, cruised around South America and worked their way up Central America and got here uh, to the U.S. There's a guy in Texas just mowing his lawn, uh, making some noise, and just, you know, a little bit, 
away from one of these killer bee hives, and the bees didn't like it. They were annoyed by the noise, so they chased him and, and stung him to death. Um, it's, it's terrifying, right? Just because of the noise. So this, this goes to show, going back to the idea of when I was talking about ecosystems and how complex they are and how we can have all these different, you know, connections and they can be altered quite easily. And even when we're trying to do good, we can do bad for the ecosystem. This is another example of that. We need to not only study ecology, but really have a good sense of these larger biomes to, to get a sense of what, you know, what nature has done over millions of years so that when we go in and start to change them, it doesn't mean we can't change things and invent things and just, you know, have civilization, but it does go to show that it's, it's pretty complicated and we need to be intelligent about this stuff, right? So that's the exotic species stuff. But, but again, what we're looking at, we're trying to get at what's original, what's indigenous to the area. Now with biomes, we can, we got lists. We got, I mean, this is one, you know, like one of the last books that I used in the class at nine right here. You can find other books that have, you know, roughly the same number. Some that have a little more, some that have a little less. They'll have slightly different names. There are a lot of these things in classification schemes. And honestly, I don't feel it's important for us to go through, okay, number one, and then number two, and list all these things, because it gets so boring. And it's one of those things where we're more excited about memorizing some key facts. So instead, I'm going to talk about uh, three of these in here. We'll talk about the tropical rainforest biome. And we're going to do that because it connects to some climate stuff and other things that we've talked about in the class thus far. Plus, I like it. Uh, we'll talk about the desert. Because, you know, that's who we are, Mojave Desert people, um, my Antelope Valley College students. And then we'll also get into the Mediterranean scrub, which is when you, you know, go into the hills and, and get out of the desert here in California. You This is typically what you see. Most of the state fits into this Mediterranean scrub uh, biome, this classification. So we're just going to talk about those three. And it's not to say that some of these other ones aren't interesting sure they are um but we ain't got time for them right yeah you know do some googling do some exploring uh on your own if you want to get more into to this stuff but in the interest of time i just want to hit these three and i'm going to discuss like with the tropical rainforest biome here i'm going to discuss what why it, it exists and what's unique about it and i'll spend time talking about the actual organisms and ecosystems and the communities and so stuff from the ecological uh, biogeography and I'll talk about some you know evolution stuff as well and then we'll also you know just get into things we've been talking about all right so as I go through and as you're studying this stuff just you know be working uh, on the idea of what what goes in to the tropical rainforest biome why is it there and what is it what's going on in there Right, it, you know, it affected with the level at which I'm talking about it here. All right, so the tropical rainforest biome, it's connected to our tropical rainforest climate, which we talked about a million lectures ago. And that's the idea that down near the equator, so we've got the equator, that mid-latitude, uh, right, the, the halfway between the North Pole and the South Pole, zero degrees latitude, here at the equator, we have winds coming down from the North Pole and from the South Pole, and they converge in the middle and get pushed up, right? It's that intertropical convergence zone. And as that air goes up, rain is coming down, and so we have a ridiculous amount of precipitation falling around this area, right? So that's, that's a huge, huge factor. So the location of the tropical rainforest. I mean, just in the name, tropical, right? Remember, I'm pretty sure I talked about this. We tend to think of tropical as, as sounding like some lush island paradise or whatever, but it's what it's specifically referring to is latitude, right? In between, effectively, the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic 
of Cancer, so in the middle point of the Earth. All right. Um, so with this, this tropical rainforest, we've got dense, really impressive forests. And we'll see some pictures. I don't have enough to really do it justice. Um, and I'll also just stress, like, you got to go. Um, go. Go explore. We'll talk about the Amazon, you know, mainly um, because that's, that's the one I know more. I've never, you know, been to the Congo, haven't studied it enough to to you know specifically reference it there so we'll focus on the amazon but i will say you figure it out get there uh it's phenomenal it's just amazing and you can do it and this is something too i don't know if i mentioned that in this class and these lectures that you've been listening to um, but that's one of the great things about going to college is to find one of these study abroad programs and go on and um, get uh, college credit and go see something amazing. And it's a really good way to travel with a professor or two because you can quite often get some behind-the-scenes stuff. You're going with someone who knows a lot about this part of the world. Hopefully, anyway, that's the, the goal. Uh, and so when you do this, you get to see just stuff you won't get to see as just a normal tourist, right? Plus, you know, you get a few classes out of the way. So it's it's win-win. Now, these things can be expensive. Um, you know, I get it. College can be expensive in general. But I would say if you can make it work, make it work. And and try to do it intelligently. With the first one of these I, I went on, um, I, I financed with a credit card. Most of it, not a smart move um at all it probably wound up paying like three times the actual cost in interest rates and you know fees and all that stuff um but still so glad i did it right so you know try to figure out a smarter way to do it but it um yeah it's, it's fantastic that's how i got to see the rainforest initially and you guys could you know perhaps glom onto something like that and get to do that all right, okay, pep talk over. Let's get into what's going on. So as we see, it's around the equator in the, the mid part of the Earth. And this this um, statistic or whatever, they account for half of the Earth's remaining forests. Uh, that's a telling statement. We tend to not really question it, but that, that says a lot right there. And I'll get into, we'll, we'll come back to this in a bit. Um, but it is where we have a lot of the remaining trees and the incredible forests of the earth are here in this tropical rainforest biome. And what's cool about these is they have kind of different little ecosystems within the larger biome. Uh, and, and mainly what we're going to divide it uh, between is the idea of the canopy and then down here at the forest floor. Okay? And this, so the canopy refers to the, the top of these massive trees that exist. Uh, and they are packed in and dense and hundreds of feet high. And what they're doing is they're competing for that insulation, right? That incoming solar radiation. So that solar energy is coming down. These trees are trying to capture as much of it up at the top in competition with other trees for this energy. And so you've got a lot of dense packed foliage and foliage meaning the the green leafy stuff okay so biomass in this case just referring to the the weight of all the living organisms in the uh the biome itself it's high up in that tree canopy and it the majority of it it's made up in these leaves in that foliage for for the trees right here right so it's it's way high up and that produces a distinct ecosystem really you know hot and and sunny and high up and that means specific organisms can live there but then down at the forest floor it'll be darker because not as much of that light penetrates through it's still going to be hot it's still raining all the time um, but it is a different world down there at the base of these trees here's an example of that you can see the trees packed together in here also, it's not the greatest photo because it is dark, um, even though this is taken in the middle 
of the day uh, because stuff is having a hard time penetrating through, right? And with these trees, what they have, this is actually pretty cool, they have these buttressed roots, which refers to the, the fact that they're exposed, that you have these roots on the outside and they're radiating out. And these do a few different things. Number one, these are great support for these massive trees so they can grow up and be incredibly tall. But what it can also do is trap organic material. And I know I've mentioned this before in the class. I think maybe we're talking about the climate stuff. But the soil of the tropical rainforest biome is terrible. All right? it's just, it doesn't have a lot of, of uh, nutrients, of plant food and stuff like that in there. And it has to do with the rain that's falling all the time. Okay? It washes away stuff. It's sent through the soil and out into rivers and all of that. So a lot of these, the plant food will not be in the soil itself as we tend to see it in other parts of the world. And that seems kind of counterintuitive because we've got, you know, more plant life, more trees, just more life in general in this part of the world. And yet at the same time, the soil's garbage, right? But what these trees do, you can kind of see it here with these buttressed roots in there, is that it can capture fallen material, dead leaves and other, you know, waste products from the forest. And it effectively, it's, it's like it's got its own little compost pile right there, right? So it can trap that stuff. It will decay, will decompose, it will release nutrients. So that's how these things are able to survive. And I think I talked about like slash and burn agriculture. That's what humans have done to deal with the fact that, you know, you can't just easily cut this stuff down and plant your own stuff because these plants, like these trees with the buttressed roots, they've evolved to deal with this. They've adapted, right? That is natural selection at work. Trees that can capture their own nutrients can, you know, are, are successful in this, in this environment, right? Think back to all the Darwin stuff, the struggle for existence and all that. If you have that little advantage, like early on, that, that one plant is able to capture some nutrients, actually grow, it's going to be successful. It's going to reproduce. And pretty soon, that's what's going to make up this ecosystem, right? That's the idea. The trees are great. Yay, but come on, this is what we, we were looking for, right? The adorable things. I talked about spider monkeys last time. I believe, which is what we're looking at right here. In fact, I think I mentioned those dark, dead eyes, dolls eyes. They're just, oh, you, you see no soul uh, in there. But still, kind of adorable at the same time. I mean, just look at that that fuzzy uh, greatness. And so spider monkeys, so named because they can climb so well. And we just saw the picture last time uh, of that prehensile tail, meaning that it can use the tail as an arm, right? That it was the, the one photo of the, the monkey, spider monkey holding on to a branch with its tail so it could dip down and get a drink of water uh, or whatever it was doing, right? And so they're well suited to living up in that canopy, jumping from tree to tree, uh, avoiding predators and all that stuff up there. Fantastic. Um, so that's an example of an organism indigenous to this biome. But then we got this guy on the right. You ever seen one of these? You know what that is? Come on, it's obvious, right? That raccoon, anteater, aardvark thing. It's a coati. And I never knew these existed uh, until one crawled out of the forest. Um, which is, again, that's why you gotta go to these places to just discover uh, things, learn uh, about this stuff. But this guy just came out of the forest and how can you not instantly fall in love, right? With just the fuzziness, the adorableness of this creature. And I remember when I was down um, in, you know, the edge of the Amazon, we went on a, it was a, a school thing, went on a tour um, with a guide. We got to go in to the uh, uh, rainforest and, and just play with monkeys and explore and learn about all sorts of stuff. Um, but we're there and this, this guy comes out and he's interested in us, and he actually comes over to me, and I, of course, I, I fall apart. I mean, how 
how precious. Uh, and I, you know, get down like, well, hello. Uh, and he climbs up onto me. Yeah, right? this this Kawadi, and, and gets up onto my shoulders, like, you know, behind my head. I'm kind of leaning my head forward. So he's just hanging out on my back. And this guy is just rooting around, just, just will not stay still. And it is the greatest thing in the world. And our guide is cracking up. Um, and he, he said effectively, uh, that, that, uh, the Kawadi thought, uh, I was his girlfriend. And so he's just, he's laughing at this stuff. And I'm thinking, like, oh, you're just jealous that you don't get to play with this Ewok looking guy right here. Uh, and so we're all hanging out and we're chatting and the Kawadi's hanging out on my back and just, you know, playing around back there. And, and then it's time for us to move on. And, and at that point, the Kawadi kind of mellowed out. So I let him, you know, got him off uh, and said goodbye and uh, went on our way. And for the rest of the day, my, my neck, my shoulder, like I just smelled different. Uh, it, it turns out, um, yeah, the Kawadi had, uh, had sex, uh, with my neck, uh, I guess. Um, couldn't really see it. I was there. I was a participant. Um, but I didn't really witness it. But yeah, it turns out, yeah, he, uh, yeah, he had relations, um, with me and, um, I'm, I'm okay with it, uh, to be perfectly honest. I, it doesn't, I don't feel violated, uh, at all. I feel honored to be, to be honest. Um, but I think that, like, looking back on it, um, yeah, maybe not the most, uh, uh, rugged of adventures, but still pretty, pretty fantastic. Um, but with this guy, um, it, it makes you think about going back to natural selection, evolution. Like, you look at, how does something like this survive in the jungle? right? How does that work? It doesn't have like the sharpest of claws or the biggest of fangs or whatever. it looks like a little teddy bear. How does it survive? My hypothesis is it's because it's willing to have sex with anything and often and, and all of that, right? Remember natural selection. It's all about getting some, trying to knock something up. This thing clearly does that, right? A lot. So right there, that's, you know, that's going to be the trait that would be selected for. Now, I don't know. I haven't studied these things. I don't really know much about them. Um, other than they, they um, yeah, will have sex with anything. Um, so, you know, but that's, that's something to think about, right? Connects to evolution. So remember, survival of the fittest doesn't mean the toughest and the scariest and all that. It really means that thing that is able to reproduce successfully. Right? That's the idea. Now, that said, we still have terrifying, creepy things out there. And this is a, still, this was from a video that a guy, he was out fishing, um, you know, somewhere in the Amazon, uh, and he recorded this. We have here, this is a caiman right there, which is like a crocodile or an alligator. It's just another species uh, of these things. So they exist out there in the water. And what he tried to do was capture what we're looking at here. That's an electric eel. All right. And now an electric eel is something that I always thought was made up. I thought that was something that it was just invented for funny cartoons. Um, yeah, and that was it. No, these things are real. Uh, and they live in the Amazon in this fresh water. And they are amazing in that they can send out a lethal dose of electricity into the water, yet they themselves are fine. And what we're looking at here, I mean, this is like a murder-suicide thing that took place where the, the caiman was just cruising around looking for food, found something. And, you know, I don't know if it didn't realize it was an electric eel, if it had no idea what it was, but the caiman bites down on this thing. The eel, in, you know, its last moment sends out this lethal uh, electric uh, shock. Uh, and so it dies, but it also takes down the caiman as well. Um, that's amazing, right? And terrifying too. Like, honestly, they, they came in, I mean, those are scary enough because you can see how like muddy and murky the water is. Uh, so as you're, you know, walking through water in the, uh, the rainforest, you are concerned, of course, with these big things with sharp teeth. But honestly, those, they see you, they go away. They didn't ever seem that scary. But electric eels, it's terrifying to think about that if you just kind of are walking along and you bump into one of these things and you upset it, uh, you're shocked to death. 
right? Amazing. So we do have, in this case, you know, while survival of the fittest is about reproduction, we do have some pretty amazing traits that exist uh, and allow these things to be successful and be able to reproduce, right? But even this stuff right here, it's not the scariest stuff that exists. We got these. You know what this is? What are we looking at here? The Kandiru. Yeah, it's this. It's it's a fish. It's a little fish. And so the the story goes. In fact, like when we we're um, swimming around, because it was like you know when we stayed in this little village hut thing, um, you know, for tourists. It wasn't like some authentic experience or whatever. It was for you know white folks. Um, they come down from from the U.S. or Europe or wherever and and get the uh, immersive experience. Um, but as we're hanging out, you know, we're on the river, we're, we're swimming. And again, like the, the Cayman thing, ah, we'll be fine. We're jumping in, uh, having a great time. Uh, you know, me and, and some of the other fellas, uh, and, but one of the guys there, uh, said, Hey guys, look, yeah, go ahead, go swim. You'll, you'll be fine. The Cayman aren't going to bother you, but just so you know, if you're in there swimming, don't pee at all. Don't, don't, uh, you know, get out of the water. If you got to take a leak. Um, and that's, I think, what's really great. Um, ladies, I don't know if you realize this. You have to tell guys not to pee in the water. You realize that? Like how this story is framed right here? That, yeah, guys, just by our nature, we just like, oh, water, time to pee. Um, so we had to be told, you know, don't do that. And we're like, well, why don't we do that? The candiru. That's why you don't do it. And what it is, these are parasitic fish. They feed off of blood. And what they'll do if you are out there and you pee, in the water, the warmth like attracts them, and they uh, uh, swim into your pee hole. All right, and they go up into your thing, and then they like hook the little barbs into you, and they suck your blood from inside your thing. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah. So of course, none of it, like as we're in the water and we're kind of having fun, but we're also holding on to our junk like just to be safe uh, the whole time. Kind of hard to relax when you hear about the pee hole fish um right here and now there's like you can do the research and some people say like ah, i think that's just something that the, the indigenous people told uh you know the colonial folks coming in to, to freak them out we haven't we haven't seen that uh i'm not gonna risk it i um i don't think it's worth it right there and you look at these things i mean that oh, they, that just looks like the kind of thing that would swim in a pee hole right Apparently, ladies, your your anatomy is such that you don't have to worry about it. But guys, we got to worry about it. So that that's the t most terrifying thing out there in the rainforest. Okay, and with this, I mean, all of these things. What what's really amazing about the tropical rainforest is it's home to the most incredible, largest biodiversity of any other biome in the world. I mean, there are so many incredible things. Just the sheer number of different species in the uh, um, in the tropical rainforest, in a place like the Amazon, or the Congo, or you know, Malaysia, or Borneo, or wherever, whatever part of the world we're talking about. It's unbelievable how many things exist. It's just, it's a place where life can thrive, right? As, you know, as evidenced by bizarre stuff like this. The problem, of course, is that we're, we're cutting this stuff down, right? So what we're looking at here, this is a false color satellite image. I think we've looked at at least one or two of these before. And it's the idea that we're taking a photo from a satellite uh, in this case, but we're not using like typical film where we're capturing visible light or we're tapping into another part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so different surfaces that the, the picture is is capturing here, they're going to reflect differently and so they're going to have these different colors and it's a great way to capture difference out there in the world like if you take a picture of a forest or cropland or whatever it might be with just a regular camera it might just all look green right but this we can see these different colors depending on what kinds of plants are there and stuff like that and so that's that's what we're looking at that's why people use this type of remote sensing to study things and what this is showing in here. This all used to be tropical rainforest land. I think this particular image is from Bolivia. Um, 
So it used to be that, but it's been cut down, and all of these geometric shapes that we see, that's not natural. All the squares and rectangles and perfect circles and things like that, that's all cropland, right? That's stuff where the forest has been cleared out so that things can be planted. And in this case, not in the traditional slash and burn method, but in a more westernized, industrialized form of agriculture, where we bring in tons of fertilizer to deal with the, you know, useless soil and grow whatever crops typically to be exported to a place like here to the United States, you know, so we can buy stuff um, from these other countries. And so we look at this and we rightly go, oh, this is not good, right? We should not be cutting down rainforest. We need it. It's half of our remaining uh, forest and all that. This is an important resource stop it. Brazil and Bolivia and Peru and Ecuador and all these places, just stop cutting down your trees. What's wrong with you? Don't you understand what you're doing to the earth? And what we never, you know, we being those, you know, in the United States who say such a thing, what we don't really think about is the fact that, well, when we say half of the earth's remaining forest, that remaining, that's key, right? And what we say when we say something like that is, Oh, yeah. Well, we, I mean, we had forests here in the United States and in Western Europe and in Eastern, you know, China and it just like all around the world in the mid latitudes. We had pretty impressive forests. We cut them down, right? We cut them down so that we could plant crops, so that we could use the wood for, you know, industry, to use it as, you know, lumber to build things. We could go in and do some mining. We could do all sorts of stuff. So the reason why the United States is wealthy and other nations in these mid-latitudes are so wealthy is because we cut down our forests, right? But it's okay because we got these other forests down near the equator. We got the rainforest. And and we what we're assuming effectively is that like people in Brazil or Peru or wherever, they're fine being poor and in this developing nation status. And just stop cutting your trees. Just keep being poor so we can go about our business and, and life will be good on the planet. Right? If, we, we're, if we're serious about preserving forest land, tropical rainforest land specifically, we also have to understand the geopolitical context of the economy, of how global capitalism works, how, you know, why we have some countries that are wealthy, other ones that are not so wealthy, uh, and all that. That's what we need to understand first before we just go in and start yelling at people for doing this or that, all right? So it's the idea that, yeah, like, I don't want to see the tropical rainforest cut down. My God, I want my kids to grow up in a world where they can, to, they too can be terrorized by the, the pee-pee fish, right? Like, that's, that's fantastic. I want my children and grandchildren to be able to see this stuff, but, you know, at the same time... I'm also struggling and trying to be aware that other humans are simply trying to do the same stuff that I have done and my ancestors have done and just trying to have a better life, right? And you think, you know, I'm talking about, you know, I want my kids to be able to go be tourists in this place. But you also have people who in this place, like here in Bolivia, who they want their kids to be able to, you know, grow up and be be healthy, be happy, be able to see things as well, right? Have the money to be able to come, you know, see what, what the United States is like. Uh, so we're really, we're dealing with humans. And so when we divide it up and by, you know, nations and where we live and all that, it just, it doesn't work. We need to think about this stuff globally and look at those connections, right? That's the, the goal. And, you know, to be honest, God, it's, it's a problem you guys have to deal with. Uh, you, young students. I'm, I'm an old man. Um, it, it's, you know, I don't have that, that much longer here. So really my time for enacting change and, and all that, it's, it's diminishing. Um, so it's cool. I'm kind of like, you know, at this point it's like, whatever, I've had a good run, but you guys keep this in mind as I'm talking about this. This is stuff that you 20 year olds who are listening to this, uh, that's what you got to figure out, right? This is what you've got to be thinking about and, and, you know, and, and using these spatial connections, using geography to think about the world, I think, I'm biased, but I think 
that's going to help you get there, get to some of these answers, right? That's the, that's the goal. All right, let's move on to another biome. The Mediterranean scrub biome. This one is what we see, as I said, through most of California. So this is, you know, a photo looking out into the greater Valencia, Santa Clarita region. But this is just classic Mediterranean scrub. Right? And so we see this, and at differing degrees, you'll see more oak trees as you move, say, further north and see slightly different plants um, within this biome. But it's all it's just that same general idea of uh, a specific type of vegetation. And again, it's connected to climate. Okay, so the Mediterranean climate, again, as we discussed weeks and weeks ago and in, in whatever lecture that was, it's so named for the actual Mediterranean, the stuff surrounding the Mediterranean Sea here, so in North Africa and Southern Europe, in this general area, um, that's where it gets its name, but but you can see it's it's all over the world. And these are these west coasts um, at a you know very specific latitude either in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere right there. So it's connected to just, you know, the greater atmospheric um, trends and stuff around the earth and, and where stuff is located. But that key thing, you'll recall, I'm sure, is that we have, you know, our winter's pretty mild um, compared to other parts of the world. But also we have these wet winters and dry summers, right? It's not supposed to rain in California during the summer months. Okay? Maybe we get a little thunderstorm here and there in, in some key areas, but for the most part, in California, no rain, right? From about May to September, you know, give or take some time in there. So we have a drought, effectively, every single summer. And that's true of all of these places located here. And so with that, we have specific plants that have adapted to survive, what we call these sclerophylls, or sclerophyllous plants. And so these are plants very different from what we would see in the tropical rainforest, because these plants are tough. They're leaves, that's a key thing. In fact, the, the name itself, it means like hard leaf or, or something along those lines. These are tough, leathery and waxy leaves, and it's it's a way to uh, um, hold on to moisture, to hold on to water. Okay, In the tropical rainforest, it's raining all the time. These places will get over 100 inches of rain throughout the year. So the plants don't have to be efficient. They don't have to hold on to water because water is going to be there all the time. And so that's a case where, like if you're walking through the, uh, um, you know, the tropical rainforest, like you'll have, you know, the machete. We, you've seen the movies at least. Or you're walking through and you're just hacking through plants and, and cutting vines out of the way and all that. And a machete actually works. You can effortlessly go through and clear a path, right? And it's because it's soft vegetation, full of water. It's able to, you know, you're able to, to hack through it. A machete in the Mediterranean scrub it's almost useless because these trees and, and shrubs and these different things are tougher, they're harder, um, they're, you know, more wood, like hard wood than, than soft um, little, you know, water-filled fibers and all that stuff. And it, it, it's all to do with the fact that we don't have an unlimited amount of rain in these areas. I mean, think of California. Think how dry it gets in the summer in a non-drought year. Right, so these are tough plants, like this one here. Pop quiz: What's this plant right here? Californians, you should know this. I'll wait. It's a manzanita, right? My God, yeah, none of you got that. I'm sure it's like in whenever I do this in an actual classroom, like one person made me goes, "Is that a manzanita?" and and that's it. Um, homework assignment: Leave um, your house. Um, you know, safely, uh, of course, but actually look outside in the world. We've got amazing stuff around us and very unique things. I mean, that's one thing I love about geography and what got me interested in it was, as you know, as a native Californian, I just took stuff like this for granted. Manzanita trees, which I had one in my front yard 
growing up, it just, it was a tree. That's just what trees look like. And then you start to go to other places around the world and you realize that nobody has these things. These are unique, right? And so you start to learn what's unique about where you live compared to other places. And so in California, we tend to, if you're, you know, from here originally, you live here, you tend to think of it as being normal. And you realize actually this place is pretty unique and crazy with, with some of the stuff that we have. All right. So with stuff like manzanita or the oak trees or the brown grasses and, and all of that, these are all characteristic of this Mediterranean scrub. And the term we use to really describe all of the vegetation in this biome is chaparral, right? which is a Spanish word that apparently means short woody vegetation, which is fantastic. This is why I should actually learn Spanish because it is like it's the the language of the geographer. Um, I you know I, I should learn. I'm not going to again. I'm an old man, set my ways and all that. I'll encourage my kids to do it. But but the Spanish language has so many great words for very specific things like chaparral. One word that in English we need three words to describe. Right? Fantastic language. Uh, but chaparral. That's exactly what we're looking at. Here. So it's describing these California plants that we're, we're looking at right here. Things that are tough, things that are able to take in water when the water's there, and then hold on to it and, and keep it for those dry summer months. I mean, like we had the grass thing. It's brown. It dies off in the summer because the grass basically says, you know what? Not worth it. I'll, I'll see you again uh, in the fall. Uh, and so it, it dies. And so things like, you know, brown hills around us, we may look at that and think, ah, that's, you know, that's normal. Um, but, uh, but no, not, uh, most other places don't have that look, but then the other trees and bushes and shrubs and stuff that we have, those things stick around. And so they're still alive. They don't die off in the summer months. They're able to still live, but they're only able to do that because they're holding on to water. They're not getting rid of it through, you know, transpiration and these other methods through which plants use water. They're very efficient. Okay, so manzanita, different types of oak trees, poison oak, unfortunately does quite well uh, out here. But we also have some beautiful stuff, wild lilac and California buckwheat and some of these, you know, beautiful flowers and stuff that still they're, you know, they can be beautiful, but at the same time, they're, they're tough, they're hardy. They're able to go with very little water in these summer months. Now, because of that, because our plants are, you know, metering out water, not getting new water coming in, a place like California is just prone to catching fire every single summer. And we know that that's how, you know, California has been. Um, it's, we're used to that, right? Millions of acres uh, on fire every summer. Uh, and that's just, that's a fact of life here. That's part of this biome. And it actually turns out that California, if you want to think of it this way, it's it's supposed to catch fire. Like that's how this biome works. It turns out when we actually study this stuff in its natural sense, um, fire is a good thing for the Mediterranean scrub biome. Now, clearly it's a bad thing when your house burns down, when people die in a massive wildfire, but from a natural standpoint, fire is a good component. And we use the term fire ecology to describe looking at how fire is this important component in ecosystem health and reproduction and, and stuff like that. And we see, it's actually when you have a fire come into an area uh, in California, yeah, it can be devastating. Initially, it can look bad you know, right after that fire, but the next year, you really start to see recovery taking place. And it's actually, it's like with slash and burn agriculture. Uh, it's the idea that that ash is fertilizing the soil. It's putting nutrients back into the soil. And so new plants can grow uh, and can do quite well. Okay. Uh, also, we know that indigenous Californians the Indians, the natives here in California, um, used fire and fire ecology to make California look 
good and to be able to survive and live well in California. We tend to think, you know, in, in history books, people write this. It's the idea that Europeans came here to the, the U.S. So the British, you know, came over to the East Coast or the Spanish come into the West Coast or whoever. Um, get here and it's this untouched Eden. It's just this beautiful, pristine land. And, and yeah, there's some people here. These indigenous folks are here, but clearly they're so primitive they couldn't change it. They're living in this natural state, right? That's the idea that we learn in school and historians have long since promoted. But actually, the reason why this place was so beautiful and breathtaking is because for thousands of years, the Indians living in these places were using things like fire ecology to sculpt, to landscape, to actually make the ecosystem work better, right? So the white folks get here and, and go, man, this is beautiful. And they assume, ah, it's all natural. But no, it, it the, the people who are already living here made it look this way and did so. I mean, part of it was aesthetic and to um, be able to easily move through an area. I mean, that's one thing if you start to explore the Mediterranean scrub biome. Um, if you kind of go out into the hills, places that have been untouched and places where we've prevented fires from going in, you find all of this short woody vegetation, all of the chaparral stuff. It grows up and it can be quite dense. It can be hard to move through. Like I said, you can't use a machete to easily clear your way. Um, because the stuff is tough, it can cut you and scrape you up and, and all that. It can be a big pain to go from point A to point B. But with small fires and with these controlled burns that the indigenous Californians would set, that can clear out some of that smaller stuff, but leave behind the bigger oak trees and some of this other stuff that exists. Uh, and, you know, you can easily go through. It'll recover quickly, but it'll, it, it'll just be nicer, more aesthetically pleasing and easier to move through. Also, this uh, fire is going through that will trigger certain plants to release seeds and open up cones and, and things like that because it's, again, it's all this evolution and adaptation that um, plants in the Mediterranean scrub, some of them don't really reproduce, you know, throw out little seeds and stuff like that until a fire comes through because it's the idea that that fire, those high temperatures indicate that there is a fire, that there's going to be all this you know, ash and nutrients, therefore, in the soil. And so the new plants will have a greater chance of growing, right? And so the indigenous Californians knew this, um, would set these controlled fires. It would allow seeds to, uh, you know, be released. They could get some of these seeds for food and leave some so that new plants could grow and so on, right? So there are a lot of different ways in which the folks who were here thousands of years prior to the European folks understood this idea that fire is a component of an ecosystem like the Mediterranean scrub, of a biome like this one here. And we Californians <coughs> today, we flirt with this idea all the time. Like every now and then, like this book that I have here on the screen, Kat Anderson, she's up at Davis. She's do, she does a lot of work studying traditional methods and seeing how it, you know, basically seeing how to make California look like we think California should. We're kind of realizing in recent years especially that what we think of as California, it's changing quite a bit because we've gotten away from those indigenous practices that have that you know made California what it was when the first Europeans came out here. So she studies a lot of this stuff. We'll have interest in incorporating fire into our practices. And, and one of the big ideas here is that in having these smaller controlled burns, we get rid of the fuel that leads to these massive out of control wildfires, right? Not only can we make California just look nicer, but we'll prevent it from catching fire um, in this out of control way, right? And so it's people are studying it all the time. There's always interest expressed, but we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. The state itself, as well as the federal government, hasn't embraced fully this idea of incorporating fire in an effort to make forest fires much more 
livable, much easier to deal with, right? Again, I'm an old man. Um, I don't have to worry about this much longer. But if I were a 20-year-old, listen to this. This is something I'd be filing away, right? Like California, in order for California not to constantly be in these out-of-control fires, um, maybe instead of just preventing them as much as possible and not doing anything with the ecosystem, maybe we need to get in there and tweak it just a little bit to make sure that we don't have these disasters, right? Eh, something to think about. All right, our final biome here is the beautiful desert biome. Of course, we'll be talking about the Mojave Desert. So what we're looking at right here, uh, because, you know, that's that's our place, right? That's our, our desert. And it's because it's the most deadly, terrifying desert in the world. I may have talked about that with you before. It's all a blur. I can't remember what I've spoken into my computer at, at this point. Um, but yeah, one thing I love about the Mojave is just how deadly it is. And that's just from the people itself, right? Well, like, we had some crazy people who live out here. Um, but it's also, as we'll see, the biome itself is just, it's, it's where, where the crazy hardcore organisms thrive. All right. That's uh, the idea. And again, the Mojave too, I may have mentioned this as well, but the way you know you're in the Mojave is when you see these Joshua trees right here. If you see those, it's the Mojave desert. Once those disappear, you're leaving and you're going into one of the other North American deserts that exist. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. So with the desert, and here's our general boundaries of it. So not just in California, but a good chunk of it uh, is here. There's our Lancaster right there, right? But this, with this whole thing, what we find is that this is just, it's a harsh, miserable place, okay? And so as such, with it being harsh and miserable and all that, with so few resources. I mean, a desert, it's a dry place, right? It's a place, and we have the rain shadow effect. So the mountains block rain from coming in here. So we don't get a lot of water coming in, which means we don't have all these lush plants growing, which means, you know, food is hard to come by for organisms that live out here. It means that if you're going to survive in the Mojave Desert, you got to be tough. You got to be tougher than your average whatever. Like take our rattlesnake that we have. We have rattlesnakes all over North America, different species of this, these uh, um, creatures. So they're similar, but distinctly different species, right? Uh, and you look, I mean, up and down California, we got a handful of different species. And you look out like on the East Coast, they've got some terrifying rattlesnakes out there just because they're so big. But honestly, oh, give me one of those giant ones any day. If, if nothing else, they're easier to see and avoid stepping on, right? Out here in the Mojave, we've got smaller rattlesnakes that might seem like, oh, no big deal. But no, these are the deadliest, nastiest ones that exist. And it's because other rattlesnakes, they'll either have a neurotoxic venom or a hemotoxic venom, meaning it's either going to screw up your nervous system or screw up your red blood cells, right? And that's how it works. The snake attacks and injects the venom into the prey like a little mouse or whatever it's trying to eat and so even you know if that if they can't capture and hold on to the mouse that venom is going to you know again screw up its uh, um its blood supply or its nervous system or whatever and so the thing's going to die you know a few feet away from where it was initially struck and then the snake can come over and eat it right but our snake couldn't decide on whether it would have the neurotoxic or hemotoxic venom uh it instead said you know what why not both why not both so that when you get bit by this thing oh you're super screwed right because it's it's working on multiple parts of your body right there that's remarkable and this of course is what we have in the mojave because this is the place where it's just it's the toughest place to live so clearly this snake if it's going to be successful in hunting like, again, going back to struggle for existence and, and all that stuff, that trait that's going to be advantageous is to have both types of venom right there. Because you're pretty much guaranteed that when you lash out, bite something, inject this venom into 
the kangaroo rat or whatever it is you're trying to eat, that thing's going to die, right? And so you're, you're expending energy to try to hunt. It's going to be successful. You're going to get food. You're going to be able to reproduce, pass along that trait, and so on, right? We got tough stuff out here. But what's really crazy, as horrible and scary and terrifying as these Mojave green rattlesnakes are, they're not the top predator or the top carnivore in the food chain out here. Right? So thinking back to our ecological biogeography, we have our producers, the, you know, the, the plants themselves, and we'll get into the plants uh, in a little bit. Then we have those primary consumers, something like a kangaroo rat that would be nibbling on the plants. And then you'd have your secondary consumer, which is going to be something like this snake that's going to hunt and attack and eat that kangaroo rat. But then... We got something that likes to eat these things, uh, and, and it's this. What uh, what kind of bird is that, my desert people? It's a roadrunner. That's our fantastic roadrunner, which we have like here in Lancaster and Palmdale and around here. We have these things. They're kind of hard to find. I've only seen them typically when I'm out by myself, out you know, riding my bike in the desert or doing whatever. Um, Because they're kind of solitary. They don't like to hang out uh, around people, but they're fascinating and they're clearly smart. They're watching you as you come by and they're just kind of checking you out and all that, seeing if you're worth dealing with. Um, But what these things will do is they, they will hunt and eat rattlesnakes. I mean, snakes in general, but the Mojave Green uh, is prey for these roadrunners. And you wouldn't think they don't look that impressive. But my God, they are impressive. And in the the textbook in the reading chapter, I put a link to a YouTube video um, showing a roadrunner going after a rattlesnake. And my God, like when they get this thing, like they're fast, so they're able to do that. That that long beak allows them, like look how it's got it right behind the head, right? So it can't strike the bird, like it knows what it's doing. Um, But then when they catch it and it just starts... Oh, smashing this thing. It's its kind of brutal, but also kind of amazing because it's this goofy little bird, right? That's the top predator uh, in this specific food chain right here. So it's, it, you know, and again, goofy bird, but one bad mother, right? That's, that's what the Mojave Desert breeds. Now, when it comes to plants too, these are some crazy, terrifying, you know, just awful plants when you think about it. Um, so instead of the sclerophylls that we have in the Mediterranean scrub, we have the xerophytic things um, out here. So the zero meaning dry effectively. I forget exactly what what the, the root word is, but we're talking about not just, you know, in the summer months not getting water. We're saying year round, right? There is hardly any water whatsoever. We'll have these... Um, you know, downpours that happen, um, you know, where you've got just a lot of rain suddenly shows up just whenever. Uh, and so you get a lot of rain at once and then it goes away and it doesn't rain again for another two months or whatever, right? These plants, they, they can deal with that. They can take up what water exists and then they hold on to it in a much more efficient way than the chaparral stuff we just talked about. And so things like Joshua trees and the different yucca and stuff that we see in the Mojave, indigenous to this area, it's really tough, right? Like, have you ever actually gone up to a Joshua tree and touched it and looked at it? I mean, it's it's a harsh, tough-looking thing. But that's a good way to keep what little water exists inside it. It's able to use it slowly and efficiently, and so it can survive in such a harsh environment. But it's not just tough leaves and exteriors and all that. Some of these plants will go on and like conduct biological warfare, right? Something that humans decided was too cruel, and we don't we don't allow that. We don't like to use you know poison gas and stuff like that um, in actual war zones. So that's illegal. I mean, I mean, tear gas is illegal in war. It's it's okay, you know, here in the U.S. If you're you know trying to control a crowd or whatever, that's fine here. But in actual war, no, that's that's awful. Uh, so we get rid of that plant. They don't have the Geneva Convention and stuff like that. They'll do whatever it takes. So this one right here, creosote, 
I'm past the point of even quizzing you guys on this stuff. Um, but Creosa, we got it all over the, the desert around here. You've seen it a million times, whether you've thought about it or not. But this bush, uh, it's amazing in how nasty and toxic it is. Because what it does, it, it grows and spreads rhizomatically. Meaning that instead of um, you know seeds going into the ground and a new plant popping up, what this thing does, how it reproduces, is the roots go through the soil, and then it goes a certain distance, and then another bush will pop up from the roots. And then the roots continue to go out, and another bush pops up. So it clones itself as it's spreading out, right? So it's not just this one bush that we're looking at here, but the ones in the background, those two, uh, are connected to it, right? And as it's spreading these roots through here, the roots are releasing this poison, into the soil, and it's a way to ensure that other plants won't grow here, right? Uh, and you can see that effectively. I mean, some little tiny sad grasses and stuff like that, but we don't have other big bushes or things in here, and it's because the soil is toxic. So other competition, these other plants that would be taking water and nutrients and stuff like that, they can't even start, right? That's pretty remarkable. This is out near the Panaman Valley. Uh, near Death Valley, uh, all of this. I mean, you can just see it stretching out there. That's all creosote. All right? And it's not all the same plant um, in here, but you can see how it's stretching out. And we don't see any other significant vegetation in here because creosote has taken over. All right? So even the plants are pretty harsh and nasty. And if they're not poisoning, whatever, we have stuff like mesquite right here, you know, as well as the, the cactuses and things that uh, exist, little spiky cholla uh, cactuses. Um, but all these things have these big spikes and spines and things like that. That's another adaptation. That's another trait that's going to ensure success and reproduction and, and all of that, where they're, they're spiky so that any organism that's walking by that might want to munch on some leaves or, you know, hack into the plant to get some water, or, you know, what, or even carelessly just brush up against it, they're not going to do that because they're going to get hurt, right? Because if you go in and you break a branch off of something in the, the desert, that's going to take resources to fix, to heal. And these are resources that the plant might not actually have because there's so few resources that exist. So these plants that uh, evolved with these spikes, they're going to be successful because they're going to avoid having to expend these resources. You follow? Pretty, pretty cool, pretty tough stuff out here. Uh, but it's not all harsh and tough and brutal and awful. We've got our poppies, right? Right, Antelope Valleyans? This is, this is our jam right here. Look at that. Look at all these flowers that just explode. And we got our poppies and it's pretty and blah, 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 blah. Look, okay, I got news for you. Um, everybody's got poppies. They're up and down California. It's not, they're not unique to a place like the Antelope Valley. But what is unique is how we have them all bloom at once. And again, that's because it's so harsh out here. That's because the conditions are so brutal throughout the year that the poppies wait until we have those two weeks where life is actually kind of nice out here. All right? Have you noticed that? 52 weeks out of the year. There are about two weeks where it's like, ah, the weather's good, everything's nice. And that's when these poppies decide in the spring, they go like, okay, it's go time. And they all bloom instantly. And bees and butterflies and stuff go crazy. And there's the cross pollinization and tourists come up from L.A. and take pictures uh, with this stuff. Many of whom, you know, have no idea that there are a million rattlesnakes uh, in here with them. But they all just, you know, are hanging out and taking their, you know, wonderful Instagram photos uh, and all of that. Uh, but yeah, it's the reason we have this explosion. It's because life is so harsh. Because these plants decide, you know what, we got this little window, let's do this. Right? Whereas in other parts of the state, yeah, this poppy will say, eh, I'll, I'll bloom in, in March. And this one's like, ah, I'm going to wait till April. And this one's like, I'll do May. They they spread out. Right? That's the, that's the idea. That's why we have these incredible wildflower displays out here in the desert. It's because they all happen at once. All right. So there are three biomes. And there, like I said, there are other ones out there. They're interesting. But I just wanted to connect some stuff that we have uh, talked about. And just talk about 
some that are close to us, and then the rainforest, which I think is fantastic. But honestly, with all these biomes, regardless of which ones we're talking about, you know, we're trying to get at the pristine pre-human alteration times, but it's harder and harder to do that. And many would argue that, that you know, with climate change, nothing is untouched by humanity now. Because even if you don't have people, you know, putting roads in and bulldozing stuff and all that, we've changed the climate to the point where it's changing nature everywhere, right? So you could argue that, honestly, we, we humans have changed every single biome that's out there, all right? And that's something to be aware of. But at the same time, humans going into biomes and changing, that doesn't, it, that's not a bad thing necessarily, right? And that's something I think is important to deal with. If we are truly, too, at the point where everything has been touched by humanity, um, well, let's get into what does that actually mean? Like I was just talking about indigenous Californians and really indigenous Americans in general altering the Americas. Um, and it was fine. We, you know, Europeans coming over thought it was beautiful and perfect and pristine and all of them. But it was definitely altered by humans, right? And it's it's still kind of held up as what Americans think of as the good old days. And nature was something that for thousands of years, Native Americans have been changing and altering, right? That's the, that's the idea here. So we got to question, you know, is it a bad thing? But we also, it is quite clear that with a lot of these biomes, yes, human, well, as you should say, that's the thing. It's not even human alteration. It's more modern, industrial, capitalist alteration, right? When we go in trying to extract as much as we can in terms of resources to make a profit or whatever, that I think we can all agree is a problem, is problematic. And it's not to say that we can't use resources, but it's the way and the scale and the scope at which we've been doing it that's been a problem. That's something to think about and, and to deal with and to work toward change, but also in the short term, you know, stopping global capitalism or changing it or altering it or whatever, that, that's a lot of work. That's not going to happen overnight. So we also need to be thinking about like in the short term, how are we going to deal with this? With this fact that the earth is changing and has been changed. And then you just look at, you know, Americans, not even Americans, Southern Californians, in general, right? We're spreading like crazy, um, you know, cutting stuff down, uh, grading stuff, flattening it out so we can put our, our different tract homes on there. And really, it's all done, again, to turn a profit, put as many homes into an area as possible without thinking about what's, you know, maybe not the most profitable way of doing it, but would be the most sustainable way, right? That doesn't happen these days. We don't have that that question. This is an example. Um, <clears throat> we're in our, our desert regions of Southern California. We'll go and we'll, we turn a lot of that into agricultural land, which is crazy, you know, in and of itself right there where we, we like to farm in the places where we shouldn't be farming, but we do it because you can get the land cheap. And then we have the California aqueduct. And so you can get water for pretty cheap and you can turn a profit and, and all that. Right. So we've got this agriculture that shouldn't exist. But then when that's not profitable enough, we get rid of the agriculture and we put up our homes. But this it's this checkerboard development stuff, right? It's the idea that we'll have these homes right here. And then rather than filling in this area, well, this was actually cheaper and for sale. So we'll put up some homes right there. And we keep spreading outward. We're growing horizontally. And that could be a big deal in terms of, you know, resources, just cost of living in general. Right, because when you have stuff like that, it's spreading. It means you need more fire departments and garbage trucks and schools and stuff like that, because we are so spread out. Right, let alone the resources necessary, like the water necessary to have this many people living in these dry desert conditions or places where you know, again, all summer long, if we're not even in the desert, if we're in the Mediterranean scrub, we don't have new rain coming in and all that, yet we expect to be able to still have our green lawns and and that stuff, right? Water for Californians, that's going to be a big deal. Uh, and we've seen that in 
recent years and we were starting to understand that we're there's a lot going on that we need to deal with but we're not fully addressing it and i don't have all the answers um but i have talked to people uh and this was something a guy I got to to talk to um who his whole deal was crickets crickets are going to be the answer and I, I talked about this before with with water uh it's not just the water we're drinking it's the um the water we're using to make food right we talked about how like cows like not only when i was talking about how inefficient it is if you guys keep eating meat you know beef specifically you're you're stealing food from my kids uh, effectively you're going to be responsible for their death uh and, and all that so again where are my vegetarians at yeah you're the the heroes but let's say you still need protein and all that yeah i mean we can you know chicken can be a little more responsible um but you know what's really responsible crickets chock full of protein and very low water and all that crickets might be the solution right and so this guy he he put together these these protein bars out of crickets and what he did is he raised crickets and then like mushed them up ground them into this flour and then made these little cliff bar type things out of it uh and they were very affordable they were like you know eight dollars a bar or something ridiculous i think you can maybe still find these in whole foods um they're you know so okay not the most practical thing for us to buy and honestly though the cricket not bad um these these were still terrible um to eat but it wasn't because of the cricket it was all the other stuff that that uh was put into it like there's way too much ginger uh in this one and so it was kind of harsh to eat um but the cricket part not a big deal Right, and you wouldn't even know you're eating cricket, except he kept, you know, talking about it's a cricket bar, and and you know, bragging about crickets and putting insects and stuff on the packaging. Um, yeah, they're gross looking, but you know, maybe that's something to to deal with. Luckily, I'll be dead soon. Um, myself again, old guy, don't have to think about it. But food, that's like what we're eating, what we're consuming in that way. We need to eat to live. But in order to live more comfortably, you know, we need to be questioning stuff like that. That's all I'm saying. That's so just, you know, instead of reaching for that burger, um, you know, reach for that cricket. Yeah, they're fine. You, you'll, you'll grow to be okay with it um, in the futuristic hellscape that is fast approaching. Uh, all right. So, yeah, we got to start thinking about this stuff. But one thing that humans have been getting into is like, look, we have broke the earth bad right we have um we screwed it up my god we had a good run um but the climate is broken and that's causing other stuff to be broken and we need look we broke it so much that like eating crickets and planting some trees and all that might not be the the way forward um we got to look into geoengineering okay that's our our move here where we're what we're doing is we're we're consciously doing something to change the entire planet okay some kind of way to engineer a solution to climate change right more than than you know just you know conserving electricity or whatever but like actively making some kind of change to the planet itself physically changing the climate and so what we did you know, a few years ago now there was this symposium thing that that happened this meeting some of the best and brightest minds, people from, you know, Harvard and MIT and Oxford and, you know, all these incredible institutions around the world, very smart, brilliant people, they came together to debate geoengineering and to come up with ideas about what's the best way forward. And I've got some, this, you know, was in the news uh, at the time and, you know, everybody was excited about when this happened and newspapers and online news outlets uh you know had some graphics and stuff showing what the best and the brightest came up with this is what we're going to do to fix this stuff we have things like grow trees mm -hmm. yeah we just plant a tree extra trees we're good baby um the best and brightest right think about that um you know if, if you can't get into harvard or oxford or, or any of these places yeah, maybe you're not smart enough. Maybe you don't have these bold ideas, right? Like grow trees. 
<laughs> that says a lot about, um, yeah, higher education and just how impressive some of these universities are. Um, but, you know, I, I digress. Uh, yeah, so we got simple stuff like that. Okay, that's ridiculous. And I have, there's stuff like in the textbook. You can read uh, about some of the possible issues with that, let alone, even if there aren't issues per se. Look, we've been planting trees since I was, I remember Arbor Day in like first or second grade. And we got trees when I was, you know, in school and, and we planted the trees and all that. We've been planting trees like crazy. Climate's still getting worse, right? Clearly that's not enough to do this. Now we have other things, um, you know, like greening deserts, right? This is another brilliant thing. Like, look, if we're, you know, we, we uh, climate's changing and we need to think about stuff. Like, let's figure out how we can grow stuff in deserts. Um yeah, we've been doing that, and it's and it's something I didn't talk about because I'm not getting into soils this uh, semester. But yeah, we've we've greened deserts already. That's something we've done throughout the 20th century. We find every single time um, it's a disaster. For, for it's what got us into this mess in the first place. All right, so that's all gar like a lot of this stuff is garbage. But then we get into the bold thing. This is the kind of stuff that yeah is awesome. Giant reflectors in orbit huh space mirrors yeah space mirrors what we're gonna do check this out we'll make space mirrors we'll, we'll send them up into space there'll be these satellites that have giant mirrors on them and they'll hang out in orbit and when it's getting just a little too hot well we tilt the mirror <coughs> so it hits that solar radiation hits it bounces right back out into space never even makes it down here Right? It's the same principle, effectively, when you're parking your car in the summer and you put that foil thing in the windshield so it stays cool in your car. We'll just have a bunch of those up in space. Yeah! Right? That sounds easy. I mean, like, why would we, why would we try to really get at the root cause of this stuff? Let's just put foil around the planet and we'll be, we'll be cool. Like, let alone, not only is that terrifying to to think about um yeah you know it's, it seems like there are gonna be a lot of problems um with that it seems like maybe instead of space mirrors maybe invest a little more in solar technology but you know who you know again i'm not one of the best and brightest um mine's out i'm not a space mirror kind of guy so what do i know um here's another one uh look and this is oh this is a good one so like we're you know we talked about sea ice it's disappearing not only is it important for polar bears and stuff to hang out on, um, but it affects albedo, right? The reflective quality of our surface. Because, like, we don't necessarily need space mirrors because we have stuff down here that takes in that short wave radiation and immediately bounces it back up, right? Like sea ice. But who says it has to be ice, right? What if we put, like, some styrofoam out there in the ocean, right? It's white. It'll be like a pool floaty for a polar bear. And at the same time, it's sending uh, sunlight back up in the space, right? We'll, we'll fix this by littering, uh, is effectively what's going on there. Uh, here's some space mirrors, uh, up there, but this, this maybe is one of my favorites, um, right here. Sulfur balloons. Yeah. So what we do, check this out, is we send some hot air balloons up into space, like up into the stratosphere, and they're just full of sulfur and they belch that out all over. And it's this, it, it'll be a barrier. It won't allow sunlight, this incoming solar radiation, to come through, or at least not as much to come through. And we got this idea from volcanoes. Stratovolcanoes, when they erupt and they explode, they can send all this ash and stuff up into the stratosphere, hence the name Stratovolcano. Uh, so they send this stuff up there. And we've seen that it actually changes global climates, some of these massive explosions. Uh, you know, for a year or two after the explosion, because we've got this layer of pollution up in the uh, stratosphere, solar radiation can't come through as easily, so temperatures are cooler, right? That's the idea. Look, we can't wait for volcanoes to continue to erupt and all that. They don't do it nearly enough. So we send balloons up, we put sulfur up there, we're going to be fine, right? It'll be great. It's getting a little too hot, put some more sulfur up win win yeah i don't know and and like what this would do to the light that's the one thing that gets to me like i feel like it, everything down here would be yellow it'd be high enough up where it wouldn't stink 
we wouldn't notice it. But I do feel like the entire earth would just be like a really terrible Instagram filter uh, or whatever, where everything would have this sickly yellow haze. But at least, you know, we'd be we'd be in the 80s. It would be, you know, nice summers and, and all of that stuff. So that's, uh, yeah. Now one thing, like in this one, I think this, yeah, was from the New York Times. They do give some problems. Um, what's going on here? So like the problem with the sulfur balloons may damage ozone layer. And I love how they just throw that out there. Like, okay, yeah. Uh, so we'll get this, we'll be cooler temperatures. Now we may totally destroy the ozone layer. This thing we've been trying to build back. But hey, 80 degree summers, am I right? Like that right there, that one little simple statement says so much about this stuff. But again, we haven't learned anything about connecting this stuff and how complicated the earth is right no basically nobody's taking geography 101 you guys think about that if you've gone through this class if you've listened to all this stuff successfully passed the class you are now really you're 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 better suited to fix the planet than most of the other people working here uh at least it would seem uh based on some of this bonehead stuff like yeah we might destroy this but hey this no it's all connected right it's a big issue and another thing Speaking of connected that they're not even getting into, one big issue with this is all this stuff is global, which means that somebody, um, you know, can't just, we can't just have one country in charge, right? Like the, we tend to think like, yes, it would be the United States that would lead the way because we're the best country and all of that. But there are two problems with that. Number one, assuming that we're going to develop this stuff before somebody else is naive. Um, but number two, like that's inc this is super villain level power right here, right? Where we could really control the entire climate of the Earth if we control these sulfur balloons in the sky. Let's say we're not happy. We're like, hey, hey, China. Uh, you know, we don't like TikTok or what? what why are we hate China all the time? That's a that's a whole other deal, um, which is ridiculous. Um, but no, maybe we don't like China. Uh, and so we say, hey, China, we don't like what you're doing. So play ball or winter forever. And we just crank up the sulfur and, and they all freeze to death, right? Super villain. That's, that's what it is. But again, that's assuming we do it. There's a good chance that, you know, China uh, or some other big global uh, player could do this before us. And then we're screwed, right? And it's like, hey, you asked, you were worried about TikTok. Uh, winter forever and, and then we're in trouble right so all of this this look guys best and brightest right harvard oxford blah, 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 blah. yeah what well, the point with this is we the grown-ups have tried um not only did the grown-ups break the earth we we can't even we're not even trying to fix it to be honest we're just kind of waiting to die um if i were a 20 year old Hey, I'd be freaked out. This is, I mean, what an amazing time to be alive. What a terrifying time to be alive. But at the same time, uh, there, there's a lot of potential out there. And you can see that with things that are going on. Like over the past few years, really even the past decade, we're seeing massive changes around the world and how we think about a whole host of things, whether it's, you know, social and cultural stuff how we deal with nature and the earth itself. Things are changing and change is, is slow and all that, but there's a lot of potential to live in a better world than we do today. Honestly, if I thought it was as bleak as sometimes I make it out to be, I mean, yeah, climate change is terrifying, but if I thought there was no hope, I wouldn't be here telling you guys this stuff because, you know, I would have just just crawled off into the desert to die years ago. No, there's there's hope. There's plenty of opportunity to fix this, to make a world that is worth living in, right? Um, but I am serious. And then I, I do say, like, for me, I'm at the point where I am kind of set in my ways. The best thing I can do is talk to you guys and try to inspire those who are at the beginnings of their careers. And I even say that too. I'm saying like 20 year olds. Um, but even if you're not, even if you return to school, if you're an older student, um, and, and do, it doesn't mean you're, you know, as useless as I am. No, actually it's really what it is. It's the people starting this career at the beginnings of it. This is that moment where you can, can seize that opportunity 
and do well and change the world for the better. As cliche and jive as that sounds, you can make a difference. Now, it, it's not, you know, you don't want to be so naive to think like, I'm just going to tell everybody to be friends and we're all going to be friends and that kind of stuff. But we can enact this positive change. A little bit of that, we can do it. All right. And one of the ways in which we can do it is college. I want you guys to make sure that you're taking advantage of this time. Uh, and you may be thinking too, like, you, you know, if you're stuck taking classes in the midst of a pandemic or you can't do whatever, you know, college is crazy expensive and all that. Like, yeah, it's, there's some things setting you back. Um, but really, you know, to make the most of that college degree, whether it's an associate's degree or a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD or whatever, like you can get a lot out of this stuff. It's why I never really left school. Uh, I wanted to stay here because I just love what happens in higher education, what can be done. And I want you guys, I mean, think about that. Take advantage of this time. You're probably, you, you know, you signed up for college just to get a job and, to, you know, do what your parents want you to do or, or whatever. But don't think of it that way. This, I grew so much. Like high school to, to, to preschool, a huge waste of time. Oh, garbage. And I know some of you are fresh out of high school and you're like, man, those were the best time. No, it's garbage. You'll see that down the road. College stuff, university stuff, that's where you really start to learn about the world, about who you are. You start to, you know, meet people who are truly like-minded, not just people you happen to live next to, right? Um, a lot of opportunity out there. That's what I'm getting at. Make the most of this time. Seize this stuff and take what you've hopefully gotten from this class and remember that everything is connected. Space, place, location, all this stuff, it matters. Where stuff is happening is just as important as what is happening. All right? Take that with you. Use that. You guys are going to be fine. All right? You're going to we're going to figure this out. Uh we're going to fix this stuff. It's going to be a better future. I mean, I, I won't see it. I'm going to be dead soon. But but you guys, enjoy that better future. All right? All right, geographers. It's been, uh, it's been a class. Uh, good luck studying for that last exam. As always, communicate with me should you need anything. Uh, and, you know, in the meantime, happy learning.